Hello and welcome to West Wind, an audio podcast about cancer, technology and medicine, and policy issues. I'm host and medical oncologist, Dr. Jack West, from the City of Hope Comprehensive Cancer Center in the Los Angeles area. You can find West Wind material at beaconmedic, one word, dot com, at iTunes, or just about anywhere you get podcast content. I would just ask that you show your interest and support by subscribing, commenting, sharing by telling friends and colleagues in person and on social media, and rating it however you feel is appropriate. You can also share your ideas and opinions by emailing us at westwindpodcast at gmail.com. We're continuing our discussion with global oncology expert, Dr. Gilberto Lopez. So you've been here in Miami mm-hmm. for the last several years. It's been right. a very good run. It's been a fantastic run. It's been a very productive three years. We have been trying to get our NCI designation, and I cannot officially mention anything about that yet, but it's okay. uh, going to be good news soon. Okay. And well, um, our program has grown very quickly. So the Cancer Center has made a strong commitment to global health and global oncology. We have hired uh, people that have been helping me run a number of projects. And the main two things that we created are a pilot grant so that we can stimulate colleagues within the Cancer Center to create global health-related projects. And we give three of these grants every year, about $25,000 each. And we also created a Global Oncology Fellowship, which we bring a colleague from Latin America who spends a year with us. And we tailored that fellowship to what the colleague needs. So the first year colleague is actually an oncologist from Haiti. She has been working with the partners group in Hospital Mirabale and the groups in Haiti. And she's actually an internal medicine physician who had never had a formal training in oncology, although she had been doing this for seven years. And honestly, she works as well as any oncologist I know. Mm And we brought her in, and she's learned over the last 12 months. She's about to finish her fellowship in two more months. But over the last 10 months, she's learned how to do outcomes research so that we can create databases and make sure that we analyze the data and we can learn from the experience that they have in Haiti as well. So she not only has done clinical rotations and pretty much honed in her oncology skills, but also learn how to do outcomes research. And we also train her on basics of health economics so that she can help her local government make decisions about what makes sense and doesn't make sense in terms of spending their resources. We talked about how Miami is really a Mm -hmm. convergence of cultures and a big center of global oncology, which is a young field still as a concept. And in some ways, while it's great to have a leading program here, you Mm -hmm. don't want it to be the only program. Absolutely not. So what's happening elsewhere in the U.S. or around the world to make global oncology its own discipline? So most NCI designated comprehensive cancer centers actually have some international exposure and some international projects as well. The NCI has just finished a work of doing a survey and compiling these data, so I cannot officially make those numbers available yet, but soon we'll be able to, and I'll, I'll send you some of this information. We, we should have that coming up in the Journal of Global Oncology in a few months. But the main message is a lot of programs in the U.S. do have global oncology presence. And a lot of these started as having somebody who came and spent a few weeks in the cancer center, and then you go back and you start having different projects. As a society, what we're doing at ASCO is that we have had a global oncology task force that has actually mapped what the strategy for the society should be moving forward to try to improve and to truly create global oncology as an area of academic interest. And we now have a specific task force for academic global oncology. And the main things that ASCO have been doing is a number of different courses and multidisciplinary meetings, but also fostering research grants. So the same way we have done global pilot grants at the University of Miami, ASCO now has young investigator awards that are for global health. And I've been lucky to be the chair for these first two years. And we have now uh, given away more than 10 awards for projects that involve global oncology, usually involve studying different aspects of biology or different aspects of how to implement 
care in low income countries. So there's a number of projects that um, are very interesting that we look forward to seeing come to fruition in the next few years from new targeted treatments for gallbladder cancer, which is something that we barely see in the U.S., to different ways of organizing how you treat neutropenic fever for pediatric hospitals around the world. So it's a very large array of different possibilities that actually fall under the global oncology umbrella. And that's one of our problems. It may be too broad a group or a category. Yeah, that's one of the things I was thinking that there's so much that could fall mm -hmm. under this. Absolutely. I mean, there's Absolutely. disparities yep. by you know, yep. low and middle income countries mm -hmm. versus higher income. I mean, when we have ASCO discussions about, well, you need to use osimertinib for everything. And, yep. and I realize that mm -hmm. uh, this is a bit of a Marie Antoinette let them eat cake kind Absolutely. of discussion that in many parts mm -hmm. of the world, drugs that cost $15,000 or more a month are not yeah. accessible. To. So it's it's a great example. So we did a formal cost effectiveness evaluation of osimertinib. We published at GEM Oncology last year. And that showed that it's not cost effective. As effective as it is, and as such a great drug, you even have less toxicity, which is the home run you want when you're developing any new drug, because it's so costly, it's not cost effective at all. And that is a major issue, and that's becoming a major issue in the US as well. We can use that as an example. Our colleagues in Asia now are starting to use platinum, pemetraxid, and gefitinib or alotinib because right. all of these drugs have become generic now right. and you can get the same 19 months or so of, uh, of progression-free survival. So right. it's a fascinating dichotomy that we live today. Well, a lot in the U.S., we largely practice as if money has no... Yep. It's a, At an know, individual inelastic. level, we yeah. definitely do, absolutely. And uh, that's just not the way the world works, no. anymore, nor is it necessarily the way it should be. So, no. But, you know, you have that, you have issues with the availability of drugs you mm -hmm. uh, and uh, access to care from people who may have to travel Absolutely. incredible distances you know centralized systems versus decentralized how do you get the care out to where the people are and then one of the other things that you know, I, I spend a lot of time thinking and trying to work on how to get the, the latest information out to people but that's a real gap that's become a bottleneck all the advances that we have at you know ASCO and all the big mm -hmm. meetings, doesn't do a lot of good when it's not reaching no. the docs who are actually so treating the a patients. Treatment that patients cannot afford and cannot have access to brings no benefit at all. Yeah. So we're actually quite happy to see that the WHO this week added immunotherapy for melanoma as one of the essential medicines in the essential medicine list. The problem with that is how is a country going to afford? When we, when we did a big overhaul of that list a few years ago, and Larry Shulman at Penn and I were two of more than 100 physicians that got involved in this process, we added trastuzumab and we added rituximab and imatinib to the list. The list hadn't been reviewed in 20 years, so it was a very important effort. And just as an example, you go from spending about $200, $300 per patient when we use texanes, adromycin, and cyclophosphamide in the adjuvant setting, and when you add Trastuzumab, you actually add several levels, orders of magnitude, because you go to about $30,000 to $40,000. So it is such an escalation of cost that the vast majority of even middle-income countries, but certainly low-income countries, cannot afford. So we really need a very strong and honest discussion about compulsory licensing, about how to actually get these drugs to be more affordable. Because even the discounts that industry does give today in low income countries, which sometimes can amount to 80, 90% of the price of a drug, are still not enough for the lowest income countries. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, Bishal Giawali mm -hmm. is... Yep. Uh, Bishal's a good friend. That's great. And, and he's been a guest on the podcast too. And I'm fascinated by his work. Yep. And, you know, he and uh, some colleagues coined the mm -hmm. phrase, the cancer ground shot, which yep. I think is very apt that, that. Uh, yep. for, for all we're doing to get the newest, greatest advances, we have plenty of work still to do to just get the basic treatments that we know work out to the people who need them. Absolutely. So one of the things that we have been working that hasn't gotten traction yet is the idea of a global fund to fight cancer in low-income countries. We already know how much it costs to have a basic package of what would be the most important cancer-related technologies for a low-income country, but we really don't have the political will nor the financial support yet to make it happen. And that's why the idea of a global fund would be fundamental 
for the really low-income countries, most of which are now in Africa, but Haiti would qualify as well. Mm -hmm. You travel a lot still. That's uh, a little less <laughs> in these, <laughs> okay. these days, but I still do. But absolutely. I know, yeah. you know, recently you went to Russia I for a trip. I was in Russia, yes. So don't, what are you doing on, the CIA. On, on all these? Yes, right. I, I, or the If FSB. you can talk about it, what kind of things are you doing there? Are you uh, largely doing speaking and educating? Or are you largely doing fact gathering and learning mm -hmm. about how? cancer is practiced in various corners so of the world. So a little bit of all of the above. So even if I'm going to a place to give a talk on advances in lung cancer, I often try to visit hospitals, talk to physicians on the ground so that I can get a better idea of how cancer care is financed, what patients actually can access, and so on and so forth. And there's a number of different projects. So I mentioned the project with our colleague in Haiti. We have projects, for instance, in Colombia where we partner with the Ministry of Health and we're helping them develop their database so that we can look at outcomes and opportunities of how to improve time from diagnosis to treatment uh, in different malignancies. Some places, as in Brazil, we I've, I've even been to the Supreme Court, but that's a, a whole other story in Brazil. <laughs> Actually, we, we would need a 30 minutes just for that discussion. But it depends. So in each country, it has different aspects, different facets depending on the project that we're working on that country. Excellent. And then Journal of Global Oncology. Mm -hmm. How's that been for you, both as an experience and how is it doing? So that has been an amazing experience for me. This was my first leadership position in an ASCO journal or in a journal in general. I had been a reviewer. And for all the young guys and gals out there, that's the way you start. You start by doing reviews. People see that you are critical in a good way and you make suggestions and things that improve papers. And then you start being invited to being on editorial boards. And then eventually ASCO had a search for the second editor-in-chief. So the first editor-in-chief was Dr. David Kerr, who had been editor-in-chief for the Annals of Oncology. At that time, I was too junior. I didn't apply, but I offered my availability to be a member of the editorial board. They actually chose me as one of the associate editors. So I'm one of the, I was one of the founding associate editors. And then two years into it, David had to leave the position and there was a new search. And ASCO believed that I was the best candidate and invited me in. And I was very happy and uh, flattened by that. And uh, it's been a wonderful experience to actually be able to shape what it is that we see as global oncology. And we're trying to be the voice for everybody that has a role, every actor, every stakeholder in global oncology. We have had a wonderful, a number of wonderful articles that have ranged from subsets of uh, patients in low income countries in large phase three trials to very simple um, one hospital experiences in places where we had no data at all that have interesting findings in terms of how the disease presents, so what the ideology is, for instance, with um, Burkitt's lymphoma in Africa, which is a completely different and interesting disease. Uh, we've also been the vehicle for ASCO's resource stratified guidelines, which help try to guide. So the, one of the important things when we talk about resource stratified guidelines, is they should not serve as excuses for people to do substandard care, but that should be a guidance so that you are, if you are just starting and you're at the lowest level in terms of resources, what are the minimum things that you should have and or start with and then start working up? So we have been uh, the house for ASCO's resource stratified guidelines. We have been a voice for different aspects of global college research as well, such as the NCI Center for Global Health um, meeting abstracts. So it's been a, a nice uh, two-year journey. It's amazing that it's been only two years because it feels like it's been five to 10. And uh, we have been trying to help shape ASCO's efforts into creating such a thing as global oncology. Mm -hmm. And it's been growing in that time? It has. We, we got more than 900 submissions over these couple of years. We have become PubMed listed. Uh, we're now working towards having a, an impact factor eventually. Mm -hmm. We got an award called PROSE by the American Association of Publishers uh, based on our fellowships. So we have created these fellowships, which is a way of developing um, reviewers and people so that people can learn what it takes to be an associate editor, an editor, 
in our review room. So we got an award for that. And now that experience that we started at the Journal of Global Oncology has been extended to, JG, to JCO and JOP as well. Do you see that there's going to be a, a separate professional society for global oncology, or is this going to be housed within the existing I think ASCO this, and other yeah, I think this would be housed within the existing groups. I mean, of course, there are groups that are interested in the global health aspects of oncology, the disparities, the differences in biology and so on, but I don't think we will have a separate entity. I think that um, these are common enough that ASCO, ASMO, UICC should continue working on these. I wanted to ask you, I've seen you at lung cancer meetings, you presented a plenary session paper at ASCO uh, in 2018 on very important lung cancer work. But do you, do you consider yourself specifically a thoracic oncologist? Because I, I think That's you, a, another you, fascinating you story. work in a, in a broader range than I think I most do. people can. I do. So, so what is your view on this? So I did oncology in part because oncology is such a broad specialty. I'm an internist at heart. I did my three years of internal medicine here, but I had then two years of internal medicine in Brazil, and I did one extra year as chief resident at the University of Miami. So I'm an internist at heart. I'm fascinated by all disease processes. And I always found that cardiology, for instance, with, with which I flirted, to be limited in the sense that you're only in one organ system. So mm -hmm. to me, having had to kind of focus yourself or make yourself be called a thoracic oncologist instead of a medical oncologist, uh, has been one of the difficult things about readapting to coming to the U.S. And it's a fascinating thing because in Asia, people saw me as a breast and GI oncologist, and in Brazil, as a GI oncologist as well. So historically, when I did fellowship, I trained in running phase one trials. And because of that, most of the patients I saw had breast, GI, or thoracic. So I, also, I always saw uh, these three specialties a little bit more than certain other areas, but never stopped seeing sarcomas or GU cancers and so on. And, and I've been PI in GU cancers and, and some other diseases as well. So I still see myself as maybe one of the last uh, undifferentiated oncologists out there. And I think that this will become more important as we move forward. And there's so much cross-pollination for us to have. Uh, we see now NTRAC in a number of different diseases, microsatellite instability as a marker in different diseases. We're now seeing uh, BRCA, BRCA-NES and other DNA repair enzymes being important for us to use partner inhibitors. So I think we're going back and some FDA approvals that are uh, site agnostic but molecular specific are showing us that maybe we have to rethink. If you are a young oncologist, a young physician, you do need to find niches. That's the way you develop if you are in academic medicine and that's not gonna change. For you to be a true leader in pushing the development, pushing the frontier of knowledge, you have to subspecialize every more. But we are clinicians as well. And I think that for you to be a good clinician, you still have to maintain a good general knowledge of other diseases beyond the one you see. So, and I think that this is where the system is slightly broken. I mean, if you are in the lab, if you are pushing the frontiers of knowledge as a PhD, you do need to subspecialize and learn ever more. But for physicians, I think we lose a bit when we become too specialized. Do you feel that it's possible for general it's, oncologists who are seeing and treating 15 no. different cancers a day to keep up with everything? It is in terms of practice and phase three trials. And I think that today knowledge is actually quite democratic. I mean, we are gonna be heard and listened to from people around the world. So it's very easy to find information today. So it's a matter of you having the time to do that or not, which physicians are so pressed for time to that it's quite hard, but we will have tools that will help us. So I don't think AI, for instance, is gonna substitute us. I think that's gonna help us make better decisions. But there's a fascinating book that if you haven't read, you should, and I think it's called Range. Let me double check. So it's about the dichotomy is between being a generalist or a super specialist. And it's a fascinating book because it argues that even people like Pete Sampras or, I'm uh, sorry, Roger Federer, you can tell my age by my, <laughs> my tennis examples, that Roger Federer growing up as a kid was not somebody who was like Tiger Woods who learned to um, use golf clubs from a very tender age. He actually dabbled in different things before becoming a tennis player. So the 
core of this book is about how much of you should be a super specialist so early. And I think that that's the main argument. Mm. For everybody starting right now, you should not subspecialize that quickly. I think that you have to have some time as a generalist so that you can find those things that you're good at and specially passionate about. And if you do super specialize as a first year fellow, then you really don't get enough exposure to become that. So I think that that may be the main core of these discussions. And you did raise a, a point that I think is very apt here, that uh, you know, there are connections to be made, conclusions to draw from a different cancer type often. And I think it is helpful, and I've been more focused on thoracic oncology, but there's definitely opportunities to see connections on how local and systemic therapies interact and oligometastatic disease or all sorts of things. And of course, targeted therapies and immunotherapies that can apply across different fields where we can learn from our colleagues who focus on melanoma yeah. or whatever. And there is a role beyond having super specialists for people who are connectors. And I think that that is one of the things that people can aspire to be as well. So the full name of the book it's range, why generalists triumph in a specialized world by David Epstein. And it's a fantastic book. So I think that anybody who's in education and teaching fellows and young trainees, you should absolutely read this so that we realize that super specializing and finding a niche too early might rob some people of opportunities that they might be important in the future. No, oh, definitely want to check that out. One last question. Sure. And that is, You've been everywhere, you live in Miami, but um, do you have any suggestion about a, a great restaurant in Miami or wherever you want to mention a uh, shout out in the, in the world as a favorite for yeah. you? So I have a number of different favors depending on different cuisine. If I had to tell you one type of food that I love, uh, it's dim sum, so uh -huh. it's uh, Chinese dumplings. In Miami, the only place where you can get it is a place called Tropical Chinese, and that's the most um, tropical, is near Tropical Park, mm. and that's on Bird Road, and that's one of my favorite places for food mm. uh, in Miami. But I, I like a very eclectic range, and um, near the hotel, there's an um, uh, Asian restaurant owned by a Russian chef and uh, restaurateur, which is a block away from here, and... Um, Vladimir Nabokov's name come to mind, but that's not the name. It's, um, I'll give you the name for the restaurant in one second, but that's the one place you can walk that is a great Asian fair. They have a wonderful Peking duck that uh, is hard to, to find in Miami, at least. <laughs> yeah. So you don't crave Brazilian food all the time? I do not. So Brazilian food is very simple and it feels like home, it's comfort food. So yeah. uh, white rice, black beans, and some piece of meat. Yeah. A typical Brazilian restaurant in the U.S. is a Rodizio Churrascaria yeah. place, which is a, a meat place where food comes in skewers like right. large swords. Uh, I do like that, but it tends to be too much food. And as you grow older, uh, you start valuing the volume of food a little bit less than when you were a kid. Excellent. Well. Thank you so much for taking My the time. Pleasure, it's been a great Jack. discussion. Good I look to forward see you. To Thanks for coming to again. Miami and looking forward to chatting again. Take care. Thanks for listening. The West Wind Podcast is a Beacon Medical Interchange production with sound engineering and distribution by Mark Lindsay of Talking Speaker. We hope you'll be motivated to subscribe, whether at beaconmedic.com, through iTunes, or through another podcast service. Please also rate it, and I hope you'll be inclined to tell friends and colleagues in real life and on social media. We're always happy to get your suggestions and other input at westwindpodcast at gmail.com. Talk to you again soon. <laughs>